Hello, we're still in module one and we're moving on to lesson five, which is pressure and wind. So first, a little bit of background about pressure. I wanted to give you the atmospheres of the solar system. So here's Earth in the middle and our atmosphere composition is mostly nitrogen, which is the blue component here. Then we have oxygen, which is 21%, and then argon and other various gases. Now, when we compare to the other planets in the solar system, you see that both Mars and Venus have a large component of CO2, which is carbon dioxide. And then we have um, nitrogen and then other various gases. And Mercury is mostly oxygen, but it still has a thin atmosphere as well as Mars. And then the gas giants generally have mostly hydrogen. So our planet is the, as they call it, the Goldilocks planet. It is perfect for sustaining life. So when we talk about air, it's actually a mixture of many discrete gases of which, like I just said, nitrogen is the most abundant. So it's 78% uh, per uh, of the dry air. And then oxygen is 21% and everything else falls into that smaller category. So please note that carbon dioxide is 0.04%. Um, of course, this number is changing. And then we have argon, that's the third most abundant gas, and then everything else, these are our um, noble gases. So we have neon, helium, methane, krypton, and hydrogen. And the composition of these vary from time to time and oxygen and nitrogen make up 99% of the total volume. So about that carbon dioxide, that 0.04% in the atmosphere, it is part of something called the carbon cycle, which actually absorbs and releases energy into the atmosphere. So we see um, in this diagram, this is kind of a simplistic version of what the carbon cycle looks like. We see burning releases into the atmosphere, that's the red arrows that enter the atmosphere, and then the blue, purple arrows are leaving the atmosphere. So if we bury things that are biomass, that's going to leave the atmosphere. We have CO2 that dissolves into seawater. Um, and then the opposite is also true. So we have volcanic activity, which increases CO2. But don't forget our plants. So our plants um, increase photosynthesis, and that will leave the atmosphere as well as marine organisms. So phytoplankton also takes up a bit of our CO2. Another greenhouse gas that kind of surprises people is water vapor. So it's zero to 4% by volume. And the 4% would be kind of centered around the equator or the middle section of the planet. And then it goes less and less as we go to the poles. Like I said, it's also a greenhouse gas. It changes state. Um, at normal temperatures and pressures. So it can change from liquid to gas, gas to liquid, liquid to solid. And when that happens, it releases or absorbs something called latent heat. And this is what our clouds of precipitation is made out of. So some more variable components. We have aerosols. These are tiny solid and liquid particles that are suspended in the atmosphere. They include dust, soot, and sea salts. You can see some here making a red or orange sunset. Now we do normally have red or orange sunsets, but they get a little bit more brilliant when we have more aerosols. And these also absorb radiation. You can see here, a big dust storm, lots of air pollution um, that's in Asia. And then we have ozone. So this is O3, it is three oxygen atoms together. And there's actually less ozone in the lower atmosphere. It is safer up here in the stratosphere. So we'll learn about this later in class, but the troposphere is the bottom layer of the atmosphere. That's where we live. It's about zero to 10 kilometers or um, up to six miles. Well, six to 10, sort of. It varies. Um, but anyway, so the ozone layer protects us from UV radiation. So we want it to be up in the stratosphere, but when it comes to breathing it in, that's dangerous. And we'll cover that in the air pollution chapter.
Okay, so what is atmospheric pressure? Well, atmospheric pressure is by the air. It is the force exerted on a surface by a continuous collision of gas molecules. So that surface could be your skin, right? Or it could be the surface of the ground or a tree or an animal, what have you. So the air pressure at sea level is about one kilogram per cubic centimeter or about 15 pounds per square inch. And how that works is our bodies actually give an equal pressure off. So if the pressure is pushing in on us, our bodies push out, so it ends up canceling out. Now, sometimes that varies and the pressure might be more extreme, so then your body aches, which we'll talk about later in the, the weather and your health lesson. So when I talk about total air pressure, I'm talking about the pressure of each individual pressure um, for each gas. So we said that 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. So we have a nitrogen pressure plus the oxygen pressure plus argon plus blah, 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 blah equals our pressure total. So that's how that works. And then when I'm talking about the continuous gas molecules exerted on a surface, these are all those gas molecules. So it's from the bottom to the top of the atmosphere, all in the column, that force all the way downwards. That's what we're talking about when it comes to pressure. So how do I measure it? Pressure is measured in many things, but in this class, we will focus on millibars. So a millibar is 100 Newton square meter. You don't really need to know that, but in case you're interested, and for millibars, the average sea level pressure in the United States is 1013.25 millibars. That's a good number to remember. It's termed barometric pressure because of this thing. So this thing is called a mercury barometer. It is a standard pressure measuring instrument. So the air pressure pulls it, pushes down on this pool of mercury in a container, which then forces it to go up this tube, which has a vacuum at the top. So as it pushes more, we get a higher pressure and it further fills up the tube. And that was called inches of mercury. <laughs> so it's literally like from the top of the pool to the top of the tube. That was the height in inches of mercury. And then as there's lower pressure, the mercury then drops back into the pool. So it stays lower. There's also an aneroid barometer, which I have a picture in a second. It has a partially evacuated chamber that changes shape, compressing and expanding as our atmospheric pressure changes. Now you might see one of these in the chemistry lab. You have to record your pressure during chemistry experiments because if the pressure changes, you might get different results. Super important. So there's that aneroid barometer right there with the partial vacuum chamber. And these are usually in these fancy guys here. <laughs> you see these in like gift, um, what are they called? They're like in gift catalogs. So you have like a temperature gauge, a clock, and then one of these. And it tells you if it's going to change from stormy to dry or dry to stormy or whatever. And this one happens to have numbers on the inside, which are millibars. And the one on the outside is inches of mercury. So I have a couple of, um, I guess, points for you to know so that you can know the extremes of pressure. So I'm going to start at the average here, uh, the endpoints, that's what we'll call it. So the endpoints of pressure. So the average sea level pressure is 1013.25 in the United States, which we covered, or 29.92 inches of mercury. Now, a strong low pressure system is a mid-latitude cyclone um, would be about 980. So then after that, we have hurricanes, which Hurricane Katrina broke the record in the Atlantic back in August 2005 with a low pressure of 902 millibars. And then Wilma, the same year, later in October, also broke a record. So now that is the lowest pressure recorded for an Atlantic hurricane of 882 millibars. So that's very, very low pressure. And then the lowest recorded ever of ever is 870 millibars, which is typhoon tip in 1979. If we go the other way, we see strong high pressure systems or anti-cyclones are about um, 1040. The highest recorded sea level pressure in the United States was 1064 in 1983 at Mile City, Montana. So that's up here. And then the highest ever recorded is 1084 in Siberia in 1968. That sounds very painful. 
So when I say station pressure, that's actually been corrected for the elevation of the station. That's what that means. So we both know probably that Denver is the mile high city, which means it is one mile of rock above sea level, right? So there's all of our mountain and rock here. It's 5,300 feet or one mile above sea level. And then San Francisco is at sea level. So to get that difference, we just add because pressure decreases with height, increases as you go down. So I have to add a correction factor to get to sea level. So all of the maps that we see that are surface pressure at, um, yeah, surface pressure, then they've been corrected to sea level based on the station's elevation. So that's the station pressure. Okay, so when you see those maps that I just referred to, you might see these squiggly lines. The squiggly lines are called isobars. So isobars are lines of connected equal pressure. So everywhere along this line is 1,004 millibars. So that's been drawn by computers now, but it used to be drawn by hand. I had to draw it by hand in undergrad. <laughs> so on those upper level weather charts, we'll see things called anticyclones. These are high pressure systems. They are associated with dry conditions, which we will get to why in a little bit, bit later. <laughs> and then cyclones or mid-latitude cyclones are low pressure systems and they produce stormy weather. So we'll move on. We'll get into more of those in a minute. So there's also troughs and ridges. So a trough is when we have isobars that curve um, to form lower pressure. So they kind of look like a valley in the air. So here you go, that's a trough. And it's pronounced trough, T-R-O-F, trough. That's how we pronounce it. I know it's one of those weird words. And then ridge is on this side. So it kind of is like a mountain in the air. So this is high pressure. And when we talk about pressure changing, there are three ways it can change. So we have pressure with altitude. Like I just said, it decreases with height, right? So we see most of the air molecules here in the diagram on the right are focused towards the bottom and then they peter out as we go up. So the pressure should be more at the bottom because there's more molecules that are exerting that pressure. So air pressure decreases with altitude, increases with depth. This is the standard pressure and that's an idealized vertical distribution of our atmospheric pressure at various altitudes. Now we can change with temperature. So low pressure systems are labeled as little red L's on maps and high pressures are labeled as blue H's. I just put that there for reference. But if I have cold, dense air versus warm, less dense air, this is what happens to my surface pressure. Oh, nothing. <laughs> so what actually changes here? So you might expect, okay, well, the temperature is changing, so my pressure should change, but actually that is not the case. It's actually the density that changes. So let's go through this. As I have cold air, you could think of it as like the air molecules get chilly, so they want to kind of crowd together to stay warm. So here we see they kind of bunch up together. That makes them more dense. So we're talking about their density, not their pressure, their density. So you could think of like the pressure as the weight, right? So I have the same weight. I have the same number of air molecules. They're just spaced differently. So the cold, dense air is kind of tightly packed, so they're more dense. And then the warm ones, it's like they're at the party and then they start dancing they have a little bit of BO. So they space out, they want more space, right? Cause everybody's starting to smell. Sorry, it's a bad metaphor, but anyway, you'll never forget it. <laughs> so now they've spaced out. So this is warm, less dense air. Okay, the last way it can change is through moisture content. This is the amount of water vapor that will then reduce the density of the air. Because why? I'm taking out that portion of air and I'm replacing it with water vapor. So the water vapor takes up space. So cold, dry air has a higher pressure. Warm, dry air also has a higher pressure than equally warm and moist air. So the moist air means the density of the air decreases. So here you see 0% humidity, right? We see no little Mickey Mouses, not a sponsor, but I think that's what they look like little water vapor molecules. Um, but when it's 100%, we see much more little water vapor molecules. 
and they take up space. So that's why the pressure changes. Okay, so how do I move it side to side or up and down or what have you? There are two ways we have conversions, which is a net inflow into a region. So we have air coming together, air coming together, that's convergence, or the opposite, which is divergence, and then that is net airflow out. So I have air coming out of a region, coming out of a region, coming out of a region. So that's going to cause my surface pressure to drop as opposed to the convergence, which causes it to rise because I'm piling up a bunch of air in one area. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So then in class, I would have asked you, did you experience a memorable pressure change? Most people have been on an airplane at least once in their life and you have the ear pop kind of situation. So that's usually most people's experience or going up the side of a mountain. If you're driving, driving up the side of a mountain, your ears might pop as well. Um, that's usually what, what I hear in class. Okay, so how do we generate any wind? So now we're going to put the pressure together with the wind. So to make my wind, I need to have a difference in pressure. And that causes something called the pressure gradient force, or the PGF, that's what I'll call it from here on. So the PGF is the amount of pressure change over some given distance. The way you can tell is looking at your isobars, right? The lines of equal pressure. So if the isobars are close together, then that is a steep gradient. It's like going into a valley that's moving really, really, really fast, right? As opposed to if they're far apart, then I have a low gradient, which leads to lower wind speeds. Remember that the PGF always points from high to low, always, always, always. So in my little example at the bottom, we see the high pressure is on the left, which means the pressure gradient force is always going to point to the right in this scenario. And I see my isobars here. So these are spaced every four millibars. So I see 1016, 1012, and 1008. Notice the arrows here and the arrows here are the same distance. Okay, we're just supposed to trust them on that, but they're supposed to be the same distance. So between this distance, I see a change of eight millibars, which is not a lot. So there's a weak pressure gradient and weak winds. Now, if I go to this side, again, that's supposed to be the same distance. It's like an optical illusion, but it's supposed to be the same distance. So if I go from 10.08 to 992, let's see, that's a difference of eight, eight, so it's 16, it's doubled. So there's a double difference here, 16 millibars. So that's a steep pressure gradient and there are strong winds. Think of it as like when you put your thumb on the hose, if you have, I'm talking about a free flowing hose. Okay, the water is squirting out and then you put your thumb on it. The water will squirt faster, right? This is the same thing here, all right? Oops. So PGF will actually generate wind, um, which we call sea breeze. So just going through this example in part A, there is no horizontal variation because it's nighttime. So you see a little moon here. It's night. There's zero PGF. There's no wind. Period. That's pretty easy. Now, part B, after sunrise, we have more air molecules now over H, which is up here, than over L, which is over the ocean. So the air aloft is going to point away from the land, remember, from high to low, and towards the water. And then by part C, now it's mid-afternoon. There's been heating. The land is now hot. So we have more um, air rising from the surface of the land, not the ocean, the land. And so I see a little low pressure kind of develops over the land. And once that has happened, it's going to go up to the H, which has already moved out to C. And then it kind of gets replaced and it makes this little vertical um, circulation. So it's kind of like a little circle, excuse me. Um, so we see the little L of land here. And I, I think you can see the little trees are moving as opposed to this picture. So that is supposed to be the breeze coming from the ocean. Okay, so because it comes from the ocean, it's called the sea breeze. We name things where they come from in meteorology. Okay, so Coriolis is the next force affecting our wind. This is a deviation in airflow according to the result of Earth's motion. It was named for Gaspar Coriolis, 
was a 19th century French scientist, hence the little French flag, and he discovered why weather systems spin. If we were in class, we would watch the video, which kind of shows you why rotating causes this deflection, right? Because the thing that you're on, whether it's the earth or this merry-go-round, will continue to turn. And then the object that's thrown, whether it's an air molecule or in this case, a tennis ball, will move at a rate according to the air, not according to the ground. So it's like relative motion, basically. A little bit of physics. Um, so it can't generate wind. The thing that generates wind is the PGF, okay, pressure gradient force. This modifies the airflow. That's what happens. So in the northern hemisphere, this deviation is to the right because of the Earth's rotation. And in the southern hemisphere, it is to the left. Now, for the duration of this class, we only talk about the northern hemisphere. Sorry, southern hemisphere, guys. But we only focus on the northern hemisphere in this class. Okay, so you see here, if I'm at the North Pole and I'm trying to target the equator, if I walk in a straight line on a non-rotating Earth, so it's not spinning, I can walk in a straight line and get there. No problem. But, like I said, if I start at the North Pole, the Earth is rotating like it normally does every 24 hours. <laughs> Then when I try to reach that target, I will be deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. So I'll end up somewhere over here, right? So looking top down, that's North Pole. So I see my target. And then because the Earth's rotating this way, I end up walking somewhere over there, OK? So again, it only changes the direction of the wind, not the speed. But if I have a stronger wind, it will get deflected more. And the Coriolis is strongest at the poles, therefore, and non-existent at the equator, which will become important when we make our hurricanes later. So here's that again. We see weaker winds, the little dashed ones, have a strong, a smaller, I'm sorry, str smaller deflection as opposed to stronger winds, which get a larger deflection. As you can see over time here, the largest deflection is at 60 degrees or above, then an intermediate kind of where we are. This is why airplanes have to do like the arc thing because of that rotation underneath of them, just FYI. And then smaller deflection at like 20 degrees, we're talking Central America now, and then by the time we get to the equator, there is no deflection. Now, the final force that acts on our wind is called friction. You experience it every day because <laughs> we live on a friction planet. Yeah, there's, there's friction on the planet. Um, so it acts to slow moving objects. So if you drive, when you press your brake pedal, you are creating friction against your wheels using brake pads to try and slow and stop the vehicle. So in this case, we're trying to slow or stop our wind. And it significantly influences airflow in something called the boundary layer. So from here to the top of the area where friction no longer matters, that's called the boundary layer. So at higher altitudes, where we call flow aloft, friction actually doesn't matter because at the surface, we see trees and buildings and people and mountains and all kinds of other things, right, that get in the way of the air because we're meteorologists, so we care about the air. So from the air's perspective, the mountains and such are in the way. So that's called the friction layer. Then. Um, when we get above that layer of the boundary layer, then we have no friction. So it's called negligible, meaning it doesn't matter. Okay, so I put this picture here because it's in the textbook, but also because you see this tree here got in the way of the airflow, like I told you. So it kind of got sprayed with snow on one side. So how do I know which way the wind is? Well, well it must have come from this direction because the snow smashed into the tree, right? Obviously, this guy wasn't there at the time. All right, so here's friction um, going from surface to a loft. So if I start with the surface wind over here, you're going to have to move me so you can see. I'll put myself over here. Um, <laughs> you can see in a rugged terrain, that's with mountains, hills, valleys, rugged terrain. I see PGF is pointing from high to low. I see the Coriolis deflecting to the right. And then I see friction pulling my wind backwards. So that's the purple line. So the purple line pulls my wind backwards and there's a significant amount of friction because it's rugged terrain. So my wind is slow, right? Then 
if I'm on a smooth surface, like grassland, right, or an ocean, um, ocean's a bad example. We'll stick with grassland. So grassland, we see PGF is still pointing from high to low. Coriolis is still to the right in northern hemisphere, but the friction is half what it was before. So my wind moves faster. And then as I move to the upper level where there is no friction, we point again from high to low. And then the Coriolis is to the right and the wind moves parallel to the ice bars. Ta-da! So when we have these straight line flow, we end up having something called geostrophic flow, which occurs when the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force are actually in balance. So the wind flows parallel to the isobars and they flow in relatively straight paths. So here we see if we start towards the high pressure, pressure gradient force pulls it towards the low pressure. And then the Coriolis starts tugging it this way. So the pressure gradient wants to go that way. And then the Coriolis tugs it this way. And then they end up in some kind of balance. And that is what we're talking about here, geostrophic flow. And then there are gradient winds. They blow at constant speed. They are parallel to the curved isobars. And cyclonic flow has the same rotation as the Earth. It is counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Again, there's my little L because we associate cyclonic flow with low pressure. Um, Anticyclonic flow is the opposite of the Earth's rotation, so it's clockwise in the northern hemisphere and then counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Here's what that looks like. So if I have a starting point outside of the low, remember the PGF is going to point into the low, so it's pulling it this way. Coriolis pulls it to the right, and then again they reach some kind of balance, and so we get this counterclockwise flow. That's where that comes from. Again, northern hemisphere, okay? And then over here, I see there's a starting point from the middle of the high. I don't know why it's not blue, but whatever. So we have a starting point from the center of the high pressure. And then it's pulled outward by the PGF because it always points from high to low. And it's curving to the right because of Coriolis. And as it reaches that balance, it then flows clockwise around the high pressure. So that's where those directions come from, is the PGF and the Coriolis interacting with each other in the wind. So this is what it really looks like, because everything's idealized, and then we find out what really happens. <laughs> um, no, seriously. So surface winds actually travel at an angle across our isobars because of friction. So friction at the surface makes it turn about 30 degrees um, across the isobars. So we see for the mid-latitude cyclone, the low pressure will have winds that are counterclockwise and also inward. Okay, so they kind of cross and then they go inward. And the anticyclone is the opposite. They flow uh, clockwise, <laughs> let me get it right, and outward. So clockwise and outward for the anticyclone. So we use something called pressure tendency or the pressure trend, which is either rising, falling, or steady. And then there's variations of that to short range weather forecast. Okay, so if I have what we have here, converging surface winds, which I just told you are associated with a low pressure. So it kind of spins up like a Dyson vacuum cleaner, not a sponsor, and we get divergence aloft. So the spinning action actually lifts my air and then you can create clouds. Therefore, we would associate the low pressure with the top picture, right? Because I have clouds here, it's raining, we've had lifting, we have clouds forming, we have precipitation. So the opposite is also true. If I have convergence aloft, so the air is coming together, then it flows down and then out at the bottom in a clockwise fashion, outward. So again, in, down, out, <laughs> clockwise. So that is high pressure. And we would associate it with the bottom picture because the bottom picture is high pressure. It is inhibiting any cloud growth, right? So it's pushing down. So I don't have any lift. I can't make any clouds. So we get these beautiful blue skies that is associated with high pressure. Okay. So a couple of winds, actually, I'm going to butcher these names. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but a couple of winds actually have names associated with them. And remember, wind is the result of horizontal differences in atmospheric pressure. The pressure gradient force is what causes wind to happen. 
Okay. So in Greece, I like my little flag. So in Greece, Boreas is a north wind. Notos is a south wind. Zephyros is a west wind. And Apeliotes is a east wind. I think I'm doing a bad job. But anyway, um, please don't hate me. The European Alps has something called a fiorm, dry wind come down from the mountains. And they name these because they happen so often, right? Obviously, they get all the different winds in Greece, but um, there's a Chinook wind in the U.S. This is also a dry wind coming down from the mountains. The Sudan has a haboob um, wind, which is a strong desert wind that makes a sandstorm. So you get this massive sandstorm from this kind of wind. And then there's a oh, Kazin. Kansin, which is an oppressively hot wind that's in Egypt. Then we have a Sirocco, which is a hot, dry south wind coming from the north coast of Africa from the Sahara that is into Italy. And a Minstrel, which is a dry, cold wind from the north reaching the Mediterranean coast of France and Spain, also Italia, Italia, <laughs> Italy. Sorry, guys. And um, the U.S. has Santa Ana winds, super famous, hot, dry winds coming through the Santa Ana Pass into Southern California. So let's do scales of motion really quickly. So first we have microscale winds. These are small, chaotic winds that last from seconds to minutes. They can be simple gusts, downdrafts, small vortices like on the side of a building, which you see here, small vortices, and dust devils. So here's microscale here. i got to move me again. Go over there. Okay, so we see these little turning arrows here inside this chimney on a, a two meter scale that's considered a micro scale wind. Then as I move up in the scale, I reach mesoscale winds. These last for minutes to hours. So we were at seconds to minutes. Now we're at minutes to hours. So this is usually less than 100 kilometers across. So we're talking about the size of a city. So there's that chimney we were just looking at, right? The smokestack. And now it's inside the whole city. So we zoomed out. And some my mesoscale winds include thunderstorms and tornadoes, which I have a picture right here. And usually they have a strong vertical component to them. Next up in the scale is macro scale winds. So we go micro, meso, macro. So they're getting bigger. We're zooming out. So that city we just looked at is this dot right here. <laughs> so we really zoomed out a lot. Um, so these are the largest wind patterns on the planet, and they are divided into two categories. The smaller of the two is synoptic scale. These are smaller macro scale circulations, easily identifiable on weather maps, like the one on the right, and they're about 1,000 kilometers in diameter. Some of them include tropical storms and hurricanes. So those are actually synoptic scale storms. And then the planetary scale is the biggest, and these patterns can remain unchanged for weeks at a time. So again, we went from like seconds, minutes, hours, days, now we're at weeks. So really, really zooming out. So these are the westerlies and the trade winds, which we'll talk about later in class. So here's kind of a sum up. You see the scale on the bottom is distance, and then the scale on the left is lifespan and um, time. So we see there's our wind gusts, Microbursts and dust devils are in the micro scale for seconds to minutes. Then we see those tornadoes, thunderstorms, and local winds, like those Santa Ana winds we just talked about, are mesoscale, and they last from minutes to hours or maybe even days. And then synoptic scale, which is part of the macro scale, the smaller end, that's weather map scale. You see mid latitude cyclones, anti cyclones, and hurricanes. The cyclones and anti cyclones we just talked about are synoptic scale. And then planetary scale is the trade winds or winds in the westerlies. So just to clarify here, global winds are actually a summation of all the smaller scales. So for example, if we look at a hurricane, it's a big large cloud, right? But the large cloud actually contains many micro um, mesoscale thunderstorms. Let me say it right. And then the thunderstorms have micro scale bursts in them. So it's like a summing up of all the energy all the scales to get that big storm that's the hurricane. Okay, and then some historical extremes. 
which we'll get to more in another lesson, but we had droughts in the 1930s. Just going into like kind of the economics of why wind storms and storms matter to begin with. Um, we had the bitter cold winters of the 1917, 1934, the hurricane of 1938. We had floods and storms in the 1950s. There was a big blizzard in 1888, which we will talk about. And then there was a year without a summer in 1816, also known as the Little Ice Age. And snow actually fell in June and summer 1816 as well. Plus there was a record heat in 1998. We will talk about why that is a little bit later. And snow fell in New England during a cold snap right after that. Why do we care? Because they're expensive, <laughs> basically. So natural disasters in the United States are, again, focusing on the United States now. Um, as of June of this year, I found this top 10 chart. So the number that occurred in the 1980s is one, and there was a US drought and heat wave right here, and it caused $45.4 billion in damage. That's B, billion, B as in boy. And 1990s had two storms. We see Andrew. It was a really bad Category 5 to hit the United States. And the Midwest flooding of 1993, which we'll also talk about later. And we'll talk about Andrew, too. Don't worry about it. Um, the early 2000s had two storms, Hurricane Ike and Hurricane Katrina, of course, which is the top of the chart with over $172 billion in damages. That is just, I can't even fathom that kind of number. Um, the 2010s had five storms, so we see Irma, Sandy, Maria, and Harvey, all hurricanes. Um, not good years. And then when we see now going forward, what will that be like? We don't know yet. Now, one could argue, first of all, I only got the top 10, okay? So if I went way back, will we still see this kind of pattern of increasing amount of disasters? Eh, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, because I didn't do it yet. And number two is stuff gets more expensive with time anyway. So it could be that this is just like reflecting inflation as well. So we don't really know that information. But what we do see is that disasters cause lots of money to be spent, right? Um, cleaning up, rebuilding businesses, rebuilding homes, all that stuff. All right, so there's your vocabulary. And then if we were in class, we would have done this activity where you find the position of the higher low pressure relative to the wind speed they give you. I highly encourage you to use it. Um, it is for little kids, but it helps you practice with like where should each wind direction be relative to the location of your low pressure. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I'll see you next time. Bye.